Around 500 whales, dolphins and porpoises are stranded around the coasts of Britain every single year. We're here at London Zoo this morning to dissect this dolphin and to try and work out why. So what we have here is probably a juvenile female common dolphin. Uh, it's stranded alive on a beach in Woolacombe in North Devon uh, on the 3rd of December. We obviously know why it died. It was euthanized following assessment by a local vet. But the underlying reasons for its stranding, that's why we're here today. But as well as that, we'll be taking a range of standard samples because they're so hard to study in the wild. That actually, strandings give us a unique opportunity to try and learn more about them. So make a cut or incision down the midline. And then the second one, so we're going to take the, the blubber off. And this tells you how, how it, well fed it was? Uh, to a degree, yeah. Um, it gives us a quantified index for nutritional condition. So that's uh, 16, Matt. We'll start taking some standard samples now. So the first thing we'll take is a skin sample. The next thing we take is some blubber samples, which are taken just behind the dorsal fin. We take two samples in the full thickness blubber layer. What we're going to do now is actually take the blubber layer off the outside. Make some routine incisions. We're basically flensing the blubber layer away from the body wall. You've done this before? A couple of times. <laughs> the smell's still not too bad. I think you'll be okay today. This is, this is deliberately chose this one for you guys. There is one in the fridge which is a lot more unpleasant. I'm going to go into the body wall now. So we've, we've opened the peritoneal cavity, which is basically the, um, uh, the viscera are. And then hit the ribs. This is, this is where it gets, being this is where it gets exciting. Five, five quid, which has been going for 20 years. So we're going to try and open the um, rib cage and take that all away. Just cut them through the ribs one by one. We take a sample of the fifth left rib. Why that one in particular? Um, because it says so in the protocol. It just does. <laughs> we have about 80,000 samples downstairs in a lot of freezers. And you get requests all the time. From but I hope the power doesn't go down at some point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that has happened. Thing. And it has been very unpleasant, particularly this summer. So do you have an order you go through the organs in now? Yep. There's a lung just here. And then the heart would be just underneath the left lung here. This is the liver, the dark uh, purple organ just here. Kidneys are just here. It's gassed up slightly with decomposition and there's a long intestinal tract. What we have here is the left ovary, which, and then the left horn of the uterus, just running down here. So what I can see is that the left ovary is quiescent, so there's no scars on it, there's no activity, and then that will tell us it's a juvenile animal. So we'll take a cranial piece of the lung, just towards the, the head end. So you're taking the kidney now, is that Yeah, that's, this is the kidney. You're not taking huge amounts. I mean, no. there seems to be lots of animal here. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to be incinerated or buried or something eventually. So That's right. for scientific analysis, do you not need much? Or I think if you why don't you keep we, three we've times done more? 3,000 necropsies over 20 years. It starts to take up stop, space. Yeah, space yeah. is an issue, definitely. Yeah, I see. And there's not really a need either. Uh, most of these tests only require a small amount of material. And then the liver as well. This is when it begins to smell a bit more, I'm afraid. Yeah. I can see. Well, I smell rather. So we're just taking out the whole gastrointestinal tract. This is the stomachs and intestine all together. This is where digestion takes place. There's nothing in there. There's a little bit of sand or grit. And there are a couple of parasites. Anasarcus simplex also affects humans. You can get anasarcosis if you have too much sushi down in Soho. And there's a small ulcer here as well that some of the parasites are attached to. It's not significant. Some of the burdens we've seen in really parasitized animals fill the whole stomach. Yeah. So that's another thing ticked off the list, really. So you still moment. don't know? Uh, there's still nothing clearer at the yeah. moment. But yeah. what's interesting is there's nothing in the stomach. There's no evidence of recent ingestion of prey mm -hmm. without trying to draw too firm a conclusion already, you know, that it might not have been feeding for a while, possibly. This is the, the bladder, this organ running along just here. Quite a small bladder. They um, don't excrete much fluid. They get all of their fluid from the diet. So again, paradoxically, you can have animals in the middle of the sea that can become dehydrated because unless they're feeding, they're not getting fluid from the diet, and they can then go downhill because of dehydration. Possibly a factor in this animal, it's difficult to tell. That's a section of the bladder, you just take a cut through it. Taking a section of the mammary gland uh, for each, from each side. 
What I'm going to do now is actually take out something called the pluck, apparently. Essentially what we have here is the, uh, the tongue going back around the larynx. This is the entrance to the blowhole. The esophagus runs down here into the stomachs. And then we have uh, left, right lung, and the heart. The food basically goes in through the mouth and then it goes around the larynx, down the esophagus, into the stomach. All the fish I've seen where they've been intact fish in the stomach have all been pointing head down into the base of the stomach. So they must chase the fish, catch them, and then flip them around and swallow them head first, basically so the spines don't lodge in the throat. It's really interesting, and you wonder how they do that. To get to the brain, we have to actually dislocate, well, to cut the head off, dislocate the head from the rest of the um, spinal column. Um, we had to cut through the back of the skull. We're going to take, make an incision with the uh, brain saw along, around here and then around here. I might have to ask you just to step over there if that's okay because I, there might be some aerosol generated whilst I'm cutting away. That ear's ringing slightly now. Theoretically. We'll just take some quick um, samples to test for any infection in the brain as well. Yeah. And again, just a sample for virology that we can freeze at minus 80. Uh, it's a bit of an art, really, but there's lots of attachment points around the brain, so I'm just trying to use my thinnest finger. Hopefully, the brain should then come out in one piece. That's the theory. There we go. Perhaps the last thing we'll do then, in a very small number of animals, we found evidence of hydrocephalus, which is water on the brain. And so if we cut through, there'd be a lot of fluid running out and the brain will collapse, which it hasn't in this case. That doesn't appear to be an issue. But you can see here the, the, the grey and the white matter, just as we have. They don't have uh, as high a degree of development as we do for our brains, but they're still a, obviously a significant amount, significantly large brain. So you don't know why this animal stranded, but do you have any suspicions from the things you've seen so far? I think it did actually strand during a period of heavy storm activity that might have played a factor in its life stranding. It's a little bit moderate in terms of body condition, so it's not as fat as it could be. But otherwise, there's nothing really significant that's jumping out at us at the moment in terms of what may have happened to it, what might have caused it to lie strand. This is only one animal though out of, what, 3,000? So as well as trying to establish a cause of death in, in this one individual, the importance is that we can actually build up a huge data set now of this 22 year period and have a huge amount of information that we can apply to uh, international studies, uh, learning more about their biology, their physiology, and as I say, ultimately hoping to improve the long-term conservation status so people around the UK and in Europe can enjoy the sight of animals like this in waters in time to come.